When Obi-Wan dies in A New Hope, Luke has a very intense reaction to his death, which was the thumbnail of this actual video. But Leia doesn't. So does that break canon? Does that mean that the Obi-Wan series is breaking canon? And does canon even really matter? We're breaking down Obi-Wan Kenobi, episode four on today's show. This will be a spoiler-filled show. If you haven't seen episode four of Obi-Wan Kenobi, you might want to watch or listen after you've seen it. Welcome to the Story Geek Show. I'm Jay Shear, co-writer of Death of a Bounty Hunter and Time Slingers. The full cast audiobook of Death of a Bounty Hunter is available now via our website, on Audible, on audiobooks.com, on Downpour, on Apple Books. Basically, everywhere audiobooks are sold, you can find Death of a Bounty Hunter. Support the show by purchasing a copy. Links are in the description. And joining me on today's show, writer and publisher with fan base press, and now an Eisner Award nominee, Bryant Dillon. Hey, Welcome how's it going? Show. Thank it's you. Going Thank good. you. It's going good. We haven't talked, we haven't got to talk on a podcast for quite a long time. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been, it's been quite been a, while. a while. Yeah. I've been on your show before. You've been on our show a bunch of times. So it's always a pleasure to talk to Bryant. I'll, I'll tell you this right now. One of the the one of the ways that the Story Geek show has been imagined and one of the things that we want to bring to the world is a discussion about storytelling that hopefully is healthy, that builds an understanding of stories, um, and that gives us a chance to understand our world a little better through storytelling. And that's why I love Bryant and Barbara Dillon, because they bring that to the table. Um, so tell, tell, us, tell me a little bit about yourself. I mean, I know a lot about you, but tell the listeners a little sure, bit about you sure. and what you've been up to. Well, uh, you know, um, I have been publishing uh, independent comics now for uh, over 12 years. Um, I started, started out with a company uh, called Fanboy Comics uh, with two co-founders, one being uh, my wife, Barbara. And uh, that eventually evolved into Fanbase Press, which is both an uh, independent publisher and a geek culture uh, website. We do reviews. Uh, podcasts ourselves, uh, editorial content, a little bit of everything, interviews with creators. Um, and and as you uh, alluded to, um, I think that both of us, uh, both of our groups are, are kindred spirits. You know, um, I think we see a little bit more than than the average uh, individual, the average viewer might see in these stories and, and really try to uncover how uh, storytelling plays a, a big part in our, our culture, our human culture. And, and uh, that happens even with, with things like Star Wars and uh, Marvel and DC and, and all the, all the geeky stuff, obviously, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but, and, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, congratulations on your, on your Eisner nomination. That's amazing. Oh, that's a you. huge accomplishment. Um, and you said that that was a surprise to you. You didn't even know that that was coming. Yeah, I mean, we do um, obviously have a hand in the sense that we uh, submit ourselves for uh, Eisner nominations every year. Um, we have had one previous Eisner nomination for uh, one of our books, Quince, which is a, oh, yeah. a really beautiful story uh, about a, uh, a teenage girl who becomes a superhero on her, her quinceanera. Um, but she only has those powers for one year. So we've we've previously uh, had experience, uh, you know, with with the whole situation of of going to the Eisner ceremony at San Diego Comic Con and and uh, keeping your fingers crossed, you know, <laughs> as as you see your your title or name up there on the, on the screen. Uh, but this one is actually uh, for comics journalism, and so that uh, was really really validating for us because um, obviously we we really believe in our um, our publishing content. Um, the creators behind it, we, we really try to find stories that are going to appeal and, and have something to say. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was really nice to have the, the other stuff that we do at Fanbase Press recognized in, in such a, a public and, and, and uh, you know, humbling way. So, yeah, yeah great. Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, really phenomenal. Um, excellent work. And where can people find you? If they want to follow you on social media, they want to sure. check out Fanbase, where do they go? Well, you can find Fanbase Press on on all of the uh, the major social media uh, sites. We're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, Twitter, of course. Um, you just look for uh, basically Fanbase underscore Press on Twitter. Uh, just at Fanbase Press on Instagram. Um, and if you you want to find me specifically, I'm I'm uh, at Comic Book Slayer on Twitter and and at Comic Book Sniffer on Instagram. Perfect. Perfect. Everybody go out and give them a follow and pay attention to all their stuff. And they're doing obviously really cool stuff. So um, go check all of that out. Now let's get into this episode. Let's get into uh, Kenobi episode sure. four. 
This episode begins with some quick cuts between Anakin as Darth Vader and Obi-Wan yeah. Kenobi, who are both in back the tanks recovering from severe burns. Obviously, Vader's burns are 10 years old and he's missing limbs, but they're sharing a connection between the two of them there with their experiences. Um, Obi-Wan is on Jabim because Reva has taken Leia to Fortress Inquisitorius. Uh, and that means that Tala and Obi-Wan also head out to Fortress Inquisitorious, which I didn't know it was called that, by the way. I had to look that up, but it was kind of a cool name. <laughs> it, is, it is a cool name. I would not have trusted myself to say it correctly. But... I know, and I'm not sure I'm saying it correctly <laughs> either, so we're just going to pretend it's the best we can do. Excellent, excellent. Um, the rest of the episode, then, is focused around Reva interrogating Leia while Tala and Obi-Wan um, attempt to rescue Leia. Right. Vader also appears later in the episode as he continues to search for Obi-Wan. In the end, Obi-Wan, Leia, and Tala all escape. But Reva did put a tracking device um, with Obi-Wan and Leia. In fact, yeah. I believe the tracking device is implicated that it is Lola, the little robot. Right. Um, so I will say this. Uh, if you are in, if you find yourself to be a character in the Star Wars universe, please check for tracking devices every time you leave somewhere. <laughs> That's quite it's, common. It's quite a common thing that we're seeing in Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, so my first question for you, Brian, is uh, what did you think on a scale of one to ten here of episode four? You know, I would put it somewhere, uh, you know, between, I guess, eight, eight point five mm -hmm. for me. Um, one thing that's interesting is is the uh, there's there's always a lot in these episodes because of, I think, the incredible cast. Um, obviously, the, the character of a a. Uh, young Leia could have gone very poorly. It could have felt very um, disconnected. And I think they've done a phenomenal job when writing this character and casting this character. And, and she's a joy to to watch on screen and see the relationship she has with the different characters. Um, and Ewan McGregor uh, is just phenomenal. I mean, I think he did a, a fantastic job. Most people, even if they don't like the prequels, they go, well, ex Ewan McGregor did a good job. You know, he was he was in a different movie. Um, I'm I I tend to like the prequels a little bit more uh, than most, but but again, that that seems to be the one of the stronger points is is his performance. And I feel like um, this series has been kind of a love letter to his love for for this character. I mean, he's really got to dig in and play with the the kind of dramatic uh, meaty material that that a um, an actor once and and um the only other thing i guess i would say just offhand about this episode is this episode has a lot of things we've seen before yeah. uh whether it might be in video games or or uh callbacks to you know previous films or things like that but it did everything really well mm -hmm. um you know and you and one thing that i think fans who are intensely into this stuff have have to remember is that this stuff has to be designed with both audiences in mind. The mm. audience that knows every piece and reads all <laughs> the books and the comics and the video games. And then the audience that like hasn't watched anything but Star Wars and maybe this or just this, you know? Yeah. Um, and so the fact that this stuff hasn't been depicted on the big screen in, in every aspect, I think still gives some validity for them to, to revisit it as long as they're, they're attempting to do something new with it. And it's not just like a rehash of exactly what we've, we've seen before. Mm, what were your thoughts? Good. What did you think of it? Well, here's the thing before, before I tell you my thoughts of it. Okay. Is this is this your favorite episode of the four, or like how does this fit into what, huh. what has come before? You know, I think my favorite episode on it. I think the strongest episode is the first episode. Honestly, mm -hmm. that's the one that I I connected with the most, um, and uh, it might be followed very closely by the, the third episode. Obviously, being such a big uh, episode. Um, so that maybe this would be third uh, okay. best for me, it's, I, you know. But they're 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 close. They're not too far apart in in my estimate. How about how about yourself? Yeah. So this, this is the reason why I ask is because um, I've been hovering around an eight. I believe the last episode for me, the the episode three was like an eight and a half. Sure. And I'm seeing initially there was there was two factions and. We'll probably get into this a little deeper. We talked, okay. I talked about this about episode two a lot as well. And it, and it's this, um, a lot of algorithms are rewarding people who trash these shows and just, <laughs> just yep. say that they're terrible. And 
And I think that um, this episode is the first time where I sort of saw a little bit of a schism with the people who liked Obi-Wan, who the people who have generally speaking said, I really enjoyed the first three. I think there's okay. a little bit of a schism with people going either one of one direction where it was like, Oh, that's not what I was expecting. I'm not sure I like it yet or not versus people saying like, this is one of my favorite episodes. Like, Oh, so interesting. I've, yeah. So I've kind of seen that online. I've kind of seen that dialogue online for me personally, I fall into the, Oh man, this, this raised more questions for me than I thought it was going to. And, um, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit because we'll unpack sure. some more of the things that we liked and, and maybe thought, you know, didn't work quite as well for us. So I have this at like, it's just by no means bad. This is not, a, this is not a bad show, um, <laughs> but I have it more like a seven because that all the other ones were like eight. It was going towards an eight and a half. I can completely and, understand that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of deviated a little bit for me. Um, so, so you talked about some of the things that you really enjoyed about this already, but were what were some of the moments of this show that you're just like, wow, that was, especially since you, since you have it pretty high on the scale of one sure, to 10. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, I would say that for for this specific episode, um, I, I just eat up, uh, you know, Ewan McGregor's performance, honestly. I, mm -hmm. I think I think um, the trauma that this this character has been through at this point, um, I think that and then that's kind of why I liked the first episode so much is because I envisioned the show initially being a little bit more simpler and uh, lonely. Um, and then we got that in the first episode, you know, we really spent some time with Obi-Wan and like, this is what this man's life has been reduced to. These are the things that the thoughts that he's left with alone, you know, and then the insecurity uh, with having to potentially be called back to action yeah. or to be called to act in a heroic way. Um, you know, you see that even with with the the Jedi that sort of approaches him and finds him. Um and it's heartbreaking because you've been able to spend a lot of time with this character and you know where he was and now where he is. And you also have an idea where he's going to go. So there's this hope of like he is going to find a way to survive this. But the, 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 clearly there's going to be suffering, um, you know. Um, so when I think about this this specific episode, um, it doesn't have as many of the quiet moments. Mm. Um, but I do think that uh, we get really powerful moments. Obviously, like the Jedi tomb is a, a, a big, a big thing, um, you know, and, and specifically, I think uh, Obi-Wan or Ewan McGregor's reaction mm -hmm. to seeing these individuals uh, displayed this way, mm -hmm. what the implications are, and then and then, you know, the the uh, variety, I guess, of, of people, whether, you know, I don't know what specifically we we're supposed to read from it, but it, there seemed to be a, an indication like he might know some of these people. He might uh, recognize some or and some are just like uh, heartbreaking because, the, you know, we have a young individual. We have an old individual, you know, like yeah. people that clearly could not stand up for themselves and were hunted down. Um, so, yeah, I, I think th that is uh, the main moment for for that character. Mm. I also think the the uh, interrogation scene mm. to watch um, <laughs> once again to watch this young actress and this young character um, st have such strength, try so many different tactics, you know, and and sort of face off with uh, Riva, who um, I think was really uh, also an interesting uh, interesting character in this episode. The way that the subtleties in her acting, or her performance, uh, sort of hint at what what her past was like. I mean, we I think we all have an idea that she is probably one of those younglings that we saw at the beginning of the series. But what is specifically her her um, her trauma? You know, mm -hmm. is it that she was left behind and the Jedi didn't come for her? Has she been manipulated? I mean, it could be many of these things. Yeah. Um, and and seeing that kind of peeled peeled back a later at a time, you know, is is really interesting. And and to watch her try to deliver that that pain or that um, that mind warp uh, on this younger individual is also really insidious in its own way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you hit on a bunch of the same things that I found really good about this episode too. And and I think one of the things that you were talking about there that I think is really powerful is I have the tombs on there as well, which we're going to get into in more depth later on. Um, so the, the tombs were awesome and seeing that was fantastic. I think it's very instrumental to Obi-Wan's character development, which we'll get into. Um, I think that uh, Tala is a fantastic character. Oh, yeah. 
just done super, super well. E even when there's there are moments in this show where, like you said, we've seen some of these moments before. A lot of them felt a little bit rushed to me. Feel like we were trying to get through this episode pretty fast. Sure. But the gravitas that, and I wish I knew her her name off the top of my head, but it's the same. It's the same actress who was in a Game of Thrones and played right. mm -hmm. um, the the what is it, the mother of Illyria Sand. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, and I thought that um, she just adds a level of what she can do with her face in terms of emotion. Is like I'm gonna be. I'm gonna switch from. I'm. I'm a little bit worried about getting through this, but just so subtle because she keeps her. He, she keeps her stature. She keeps everything. Just this little subtle turn, and then as soon as she realizes she has the upper hand, it's like boom. Now I'm back in your face, and then and you're the one who's gonna get it. Right, now, right. now, so I love that part of it. Um, I thought that uh, you you nailed it. I thought that Le Leia and uh, Riva were both fantastic in this episode. I I have been part of the crew that has said, uh, you know. I don't believe that Moses Ingram is being given enough to do to match the talent that she has as Reva sure. until yeah. this episode. This is where I felt like like it really felt like her interaction with Leia was more of what her character was sort of meant to be. Um, and I think she did a really, really good job there. When she has some good interactions with the other Inquisitors, too. I mean, there's been some yeah. of that, but like she's she's gaining some power at this point. And so she's getting more aggressive. And, and that's that's fun to watch her unleash because yeah, I, 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 I kind of agree with that assessment. Um, I feel like she come on, came on really strong as a character for me in the first episode. And I was really intensely into her second episode. It took like a step back, I feel like. Yeah. Um, and and so I. I I don't blame the actress at all. I mean, specifically when you're talking about uh, filmed uh, visuals like this, you know, the, the director is the one making the final yes. choice and removing certain things. And, and so we don't know exactly what the performance was on set. Um, but when they allow her to be great, boy, is she fantastic, exactly. you know, and she's intense and, and scary and off. I mean, she has some of that, um, she has some of that vibe that, uh, you know, Adam Driver had the first time we saw him as Kylo Ren, where you're like, whoa, this guy <laughs> seems like he might just lose his shit. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. You know, he does not have the self-control that Vader, like, he, he's not co confident in that way. He's like, he's like a rabid dog on a chain. You're like, you know, yeah. he could turn back and bite me any second. And she definitely brings that. Um, and, and, and that is interesting to see. Um, and it also makes the things I think we saw in this episode really interesting because yeah. with specifically with Leia, she got to be quiet and and yes. calmer and and more in control. And so we we saw her less unleashed and more like calculating, manipulative, yeah. which was which is a uh, really interesting side of the character. Totally agree. And I think there there were even some people that, and I think this opinion is crazy, but some people were sort of frustrated with the young actress who plays Leia and her performance. <laughs> and if you're still saying that after, after episode four, then you're insane. Like this little girl deserves an Emmy at this point. Yeah. Like I can't yeah. even think of a, I can't even think of a, besides maybe the kids in stranger things in season one, um, who were still a little bit older than her. I can't think of another performance that is this good um, from such a young actress. This was just, I thought phenomenal. So um, two other things that I loved really quick. I loved yep. uh, Obi Wan using the uh, Force noise distraction um, that he used in a new. That was fun. That was yeah. awesome. A <laughs> um, little bit of fan service. I love yeah. that. Um, but fan service that made sense in that in that in that moment. And yeah. I also loved seeing Kenobi fight the stormtroopers in the hallways. And this is something that they are building, and I think that they are building it really, really well is that Obi-Wan's removing himself from the force, not having a lot of confidence in himself, finding a lot of himself in a lot of places where he's very fearful and yeah. slowly building it back in. It's the one thing in this show that I will say feels like it is on the correct pace. Now there may be other things. I shouldn't say the one thing. There may be other things that are on the correct pace. Sure. It is by far like perfect pacing like every episode he just gets a little bit better a little bit more adept even in this episode when he's first fighting the stormtroopers he even looks a little clunky when he's when he yeah. first is in the room with leia and he does a couple of, like the old obi-wan it would have been one one yeah, slice yeah. of the lightsaber dude's dead right this one he's like he has to hit him a couple times it's just but then as he as he starts to block 
bolts here and there. It just starts to get his feel for it. It just was, I thought that was very artfully done in the, in the stunt work. And then Ewan McGregor understanding that I'm recovering from this deep depression of seeing everything fall down around me and I'm slowly getting back to who I used to be. I thought that was really, really good. Uh, yeah, I would totally agree with that. And and I mean, it. one thing that is really interesting that this show is um, is definitely uh, mining that has been, been present in a lot of Star Wars. Um, but I think that fans push back on whether it's we're talking about the prequels, whether we're talking about the sequels or, or these new TV shows is um, we almost because of the way the relationship that a lot of us have with the original trilogy and having existed in a place where where there weren't that many like canon quote unquote right. stories right. for a while. Right. Um, we vi- we have our own visions of what Jedi are and they, yeah. they live really hard. They're hard to they're hard to, to change, you know, and 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 in some ways it's it's funny because we parallel people in the Star Wars universe who think the Jedi's are superhumans, superheroes, think that they're going to, uh, you know, there's a bunch of phrases from the movies we could use, but I, I mean, I, one that comes to mind is, is Luke in Last Jedi, where he's like, what do you th- I'm going to go out with a, a laser sword and take on the entire empire. People think they actually are going to do that, <laughs> you know? Um, but when you look at the actual things that we see in these stories, and especially what George Lucas is telling, they're humans. I mean, they have very uh, strong abilities, but I always think this when someone's like, like, why didn't this character sense this exact thing about that character? And I'm like, well, it just doesn't work like that. They're not, you know, they're 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 doing their best they can, but they're not uh, they're not superheroes. Totally. And that is really interesting to see with with this character because they have to match to some degree what what uh, where we're going to end up, you know, in a new hope. And part of that is being okay with that. Obi Wan does lose some of his physical abilities. He's not the like warrior that he was in the Clone Wars. And it, and I mean, there's many layers to that because you can go in a whole like you know rabbit hole of like well that's not even the point of being a jedi being a warrior is the least important thing for a jedi and that's part of why the clone wars were sort of detrimental to them but but more to the point with this and and what you were talking about i think it's interesting to see like okay the 10 years have passed he's lost his edge he is an old soldier he is he is a broken man spiritually and you know he's not out in the desert like you know practicing the lightsaber moves or anything like like he actually believes what he said about the the battle is over for now i mean i think he has some hope you know in regards to watching luke and and leia and and going like well maybe there's something down the road but at the same time you could argue i think the point of view of like at the beginning of this story obi-wan just hopes that they don't get murdered (laughs) <laughs> but he just hopes that like they live and that that he's able to keep those people safe and he just dies quietly by himself, yes. you yes. know? Yeah, totally. We, we talked about this um, in episode three as well. Um, I do think that you can, I do think that it is fair for you because this is what I put on my storyteller hat and you can see, see if you agree with me on this. Okay, sure. Um, I do think that you can complain about how Luke appears in The Last Jedi and what we're told is the backstory about sure. why Luke is where he is. I think you can, can complain about it from the standpoint of the last time I saw Luke, he was he was clearly headed to rebuilding the galaxy. Now I see Luke again. He throws the first thing I see from him, he throws the lightsaber. He he his interaction with Ray is very cantankerous. Then we, when we kind of get a one flashback into like what turned Luke into this, it's sort of a moment in time sort of thing. I, I think that that now, now, just to be clear, I don't have this problem because I, I fill in my brain fills in the gaps okay. in the story that say I can see how a character could get there. Right. However, the storytellers didn't do a lot of gap filling for us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In, in, in But I do think that if you contrast that with, Obi-Wan, I don't feel like the two are a fair comparison because I feel like the last time we saw Obi-Wan, everything around him was crumbling. So like to to make to turn him into this character 10 years later, to me is not the the foreshadowing is almost built into where he was the last time we saw him. So it's a little bit different to me. I think that um, if you say that, well, I don't like seeing Obi-Wan this way, it's kind of like, well, none of us do but we're all rooting for him to get 
back and it kind of makes sense that he would be here. Whereas if you say, well, I just can't see Luke this way. I think I go, I, I get it. I, I get why you say that because of what the storytellers, how the storytellers played that out. It just doesn't seem to me that the, that the two complaints are on the same playing field. Well, yeah, because you almost have to debate who Obi-Wan was when you met him. Yes. You know, I mean, Obi-Wan was never um, powerful because he could whip out his lightsaber and, and 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 destroy others. I mean, he does save Luke in the bar, say, and and, and cut off, a, you know, a bar patron, a criminal's <laughs> arm. Um, but but even with his approach, you know, to Vader, um, he's not he's not he's not in that fight to win that fight in a physical sense. Right. Um, and, and the fight is not by any means a, um, <laughs> modern, uh, choreograph, uh, you know, battle. <laughs> no, it's, not, um, yeah. it's two old guys, you know, it's, it's, it's why, why it works. I think is what's so interesting is it's one guy who's barely, you know, human yeah. and is like stuck in this Frankenstein suit trying to be what he once was probably yeah. internally frustrated by the idea of like, I used to be so powerful and now I'm contained in this. And then this other individual who is at the, you know, at his weakest in his physical form, but is strongest in his spiritual form. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and, and I am, I'm one that uh, did, you know, I don't, I don't hate last Jedi, but I did struggle with, with that, uh, that, that, version of luke and yeah. but it's exactly what you said it's for me it's not a question of oh luke can't be disillusioned that luke couldn't fall that luke couldn't make a mistake it's more that um the story uh didn't quite sell it to me you know the backstory but like yourself i'm like you know if i could if i could plug in a few things if you know i could understand how this character could get to the the place uh that the, the filmmaker wanted the character to be for the story they were telling absolutely know? yeah in fact there was a twitter thread today um about a person who who was literally filling in all of those gaps like i can see i don't have a problem with the last jedi because blah 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 and uh and hannibal taboo our mutual friend had <laughs> had had tweeted about it and said like this is exactly right and I, and i had said like yeah i mean to me i'm not saying it's wrong but you did have to fill those gaps though. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Your brain had to go, I'm comfortable doing that. And if your brain wasn't comfortable doing it, if your brain said, actually, I'm not going to do that because I need, I need to have this and then this, and then I need some more dots to be connected in a different way then I think you have a valid complaint there, but I just don't know that it matters as much for Obi-Wan. So what are some things about episode four that maybe didn't work for you as well as the things that we really both enjoyed? You know, um, I do wish that, uh, this was a um, a less derivative series at times. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is the biggest complaint that I hear from fans. Um, I'm actually, I find myself um, sort of in, in among my peers, I guess, in uh, a different space than they are because mm -hmm. I'm not one who's um, eager to like run away from the Skywalker saga. Mm -hmm. I like the seeing uh, more stories about these characters or their their family members. Um, I, you know, I would include Obi-Wan sort of in that because clearly he's a big player in the Skywalker saga. So I'm, I don't feel like we're going back, uh, with the story of Obi-Wan to, to the, the same place and, and not, you know, not advancing the story or anything. I think there's plenty to mine here. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, uh, sometimes it, it, you know, sometimes it feels like, all right, this is the part where we sneak into the space station. This is the part where, you know, we reference the, the old movie. Um, <laughs> and so so that I can I can I can uh, to a, a certain degree go like, you know, it's not that this episode was bad at all, but there is a, a an imaginary Obi-Wan Kenobi series where I'm like, how interesting would it be if, if again, like what I'm saying, like earlier of, of what if this was all taking place in the desert and there were like these long periods of like flashbacks and and uh introspection and uh you know communing with either like yoda or, or attempting to commune with um uh you know qui-gon which i i thought has been really interesting the couple times that we've seen it okay. um i i wanted more of that story and and luckily what is selling this story for me really well is is the connection between leia and obi-wan that i never realized uh, was somewhat important to me or, or would become important to me. Right. So, so I'm, I, what I, I can say is even though that I feel like, Hey, you know, there is some derivative derivativeness with, um, you know, this, 
uh, this fortress and and sort of the sneaking around with the stormtroopers and and, and uh, rescuing you know people from uh, torture or prison. Um, at the same time, I feel like they're doing so many other things right that I'm I'm forgiving of it in this in this sense, you know. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I've got a few things here. I've got a list of things. And by the way, none of these are none of these are major things, but these are the things that made the episode not uh, not as much to my liking as, as some of the previous okay. ones. So I did really feel like the episode, the entire episode did feel rushed. Like there's this like Anakin and Anakin and Obi-Wan, like, like we go back and forth really quick while they're in the back to tanks and then you're on Jabim, but we got to get out of here. You know, like it was very, very yeah. fast. It was very, felt very, now I've had this complaint about probably most of the Disney plus shows, whether okay. they've been Marvel or, or star Wars. Um, the only shows I don't think I've had this complaint about, I don't really feel like I had this complaint about Loki, WandaVision, or even even Hawkeye or the Mandalorian, those okay. all seem like they they felt like they got enough. This felt this show feels to me like a lot of the other shows, uh, most notably Moon Knight was one of them, where it was like there's a big story, but we've got to cut it down, so we've got to get, keep people moving, and every single episode is going to be a different planet. And I felt like this episode could have been easily two episodes long about like. It's essentially it's a heist sort of break in, right? Movie. Yeah, and it, they, I mean, they could have taken their time with it. Um, at the end, I loved this is the best I've seen Reva, yeah. and I just felt like they had that moment at the end where all she had to do was do the Leia jump twirl and just hack the A wing in half. And I would have been like, that is so badass, like that she could have done that, like that would have built a lot of uh aggression and respect I and i think instead just throwing a bomb at it was a little i think I can it's see that i think it's probably let's be honest it's probably an effects thing they're probably like this sure. is easier to do than that so <laughs> we don't have that kind of budget um the other thing and this is where it gets into so i and what's funny is i'm actually saying it could have been that could have been actually a little bit derivative and i would have liked it right like sure yeah. some of this other stuff i have in here like for example the the Again, these are minor complaints because I actually enjoyed the scene. So I don't want people to think like I didn't enjoy it. Sure. But there's the 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 crack in the in the window underwater. And I'm I'm thinking to myself, like, they didn't they didn't make these blaster resistant glass panels. <laughs> You're underwater, man. Like, come on. Um, if it had been like a different kind of pistol, if it had been a repeater pistol or something along those lines, that maybe would have worked a little sure, better. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, and then, and then, you know, when he runs away from the water, it's like, it's right behind him. And then he walks, he runs through the door, the door closes and it's like no water seeped in. And it's like, it just, again, it felt yeah. like they were, it felt like it. No, no, granted, I'm not saying that isn't Star Warsy because I could see George Lucas doing the same stuff. You sure, know what I mean? Sure. Um, but even, even the, uh, even their escape where I made the joke about the tracking beacon, it's like, that's very derivative of Star Wars. Yeah. And I, again, if they had a little bit more time. Um, I think that they could have now I now I get it. Like they're under a lot of production pressure. This show has been in the works for a very long time. They got hit with COVID. Uh, but it is a it does feel like a tent pole type of series. Oh, yeah, me. yeah. So I just wish they would have like spent a little bit more time on it. Um, and then those things would have probably been cleared up. Um, but let's let's dig into uh a little bit deeper into some of the stuff that we've okay. mentioned a little bit already. Um shout out to uh Brian Barbare who's in the uh in the comment section uh <laughs> watching on YouTube. Thanks for watching Brian. Um the first one we'll start on is the one you, that you've mentioned a couple times which I really enjoy as well and that's the relationship between Obi-Wan and Leia. Oh yeah. That continues to deepen um in fact we get some I thought the moment where you know they they hold hands was brilliant. Like what a great moment. Um, it's one of the better parts of this show. Did you expect them to go this deep into this relationship? And what does it mean for the larger Star Wars narrative in general to you? This is interesting because um, I'm someone who I, I don't shy away from spoilers. So there there was a, a big um, rumor out there for a long time that there, mm. this was going to be the premise of the show, that uh, he was rescuing a young Leia. Um, and I was very much as uh, you know, I'm sure people can tell from the the imaginary series that I, I was ima I was had in my head. Um, I was not a fan of this idea. Um, <laughs> I felt like it, you anytime you do things like this, you get you get very close to the sun, so to speak. And uh, it's very easy to get burned. 
Um, and, and there's a lot of ways that you can mess up the, the canon. Not that the canon is like the most important thing, but I at least think that uh, writers should try to, to not, you know, invalidate things that have come before unless they really know like oh no i have a i have a good new take on this it's right. going to add not take away it's not you know or it's not being done just to do it um and so i was not thrilled you know once i i had a sense where this st story was going just because i was like well this is going to make it a little weird given what i know having rewatched a new hope of thousand, three thousand, whatever times, you know, <laughs> right. um, that knowing the message by heart from Leia and, and, and that there's no real indication of her being rescued or, or perhaps previously knowing, uh, in person, you know, uh, Obi, Obi-Wan. Um, but at the same time, one thing that I have learned over, uh, the past, I would say decade or so as a Star Wars fan, um, and it's allowed me to love things like the prequels and 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 some of these things that uh, are more derided. Obviously, some of the sequels are der very derided. Um, I think there is a necessary um, task for a Star Wars fan, an aging Star Wars fan, to uh, <laughs> challenge your own pre preconceived notions. You know, and I think this fits very well, obviously, with the themes of Star Wars. Um, we were talking a little bit about it before. You, I think we get built into what we know as Star Wars because we're so intensely connected mm -hmm. to it, you know? And we know how it's supposed to feel and smell and sound. And and um, something new gets introduced and you're like, whoa, wait a minute, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and so I, I always have to have like a first viewing where it's just me sort of like bringing in, trying not to fight it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just accept it. And what I think this series did phenomenally is that it... Um, it that storyline was presented so well with the opening scenes that had Leia in them and on, on all older on. I mean, her scene where she dresses down her cousin oh, yeah. um, and just shows her <laughs> intellect and her wit and her heart because she's upset because he's uh, being mean to droids and is just, it's just kind of this privileged, you know, stuck up kid is so perfectly written, so perfectly acted. And then to see the scene after with Bale, talking to her about being a real Organa and like how important that scene. I, I think immediately in those two scenes, they sold me. I was like, I don't, I'm going to, I'm open to what you're doing because you've done this so well. You've given me a peek into this, you know, unseen period uh, on screen f for Star Wars that, that go ahead, take me where you want to go. And so I have, um, I have really enjoyed their journey. I think that the, like even the big Darth Vader confrontation episode three, uh, the most, the, my favorite parts of that episode were, uh, scenes with Leia and, and Obi-Wan where sh she wants to know if he's her real father, you know, yeah, and is, yeah, and yeah. is talking about like her family. Um, those were, I think the high points of the episodes and, and, and I guess what it's got me doing is re-examining my own view of the original trilogy, because there are obviously places where I think it could be argued, all right, this this rubs against this or this rubs against that. But there's also just as many valid reasons to suggest that there was more than what we knew. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that was pointed out, out online by another fan that really made me take a step back is how does she know Ben Kenobi? I mean, she addresses him as Obi-Wan, but when, when Luke shows up and says, hey, I'm here with Ben Kenobi, she's like, Ben Kenobi? I mean, clearly <laughs> she... I mean, you, you could go, all right, well, her father told her his secret name or whatever but but the idea is there that you go all right well yeah i don't know exactly what the you know what what the connection was there i mean i have formed my own opinion years ago but now it's you know it could still be different it doesn't change things and there's there's interesting things as well i mean i think in that aspect with vader like the uh, we haven't gotten to it yet but i'm really hoping that the series addresses um vader's conversation with luke in return of the jedi where he says hey obi-wan used to think like you did you know right. and you're like what the hell does that mean like <laughs> we don't right obi-wan has never gone to vader and been like hey come back from the dark side you know like that <laughs> right. that, that is, we've never seen that approach but i'm honestly hoping that that we get to a point where that's maybe the final um you know confrontation before a new hope between yeah. these two characters is, is obi-wan going like instead of being fearful instead of being terrified or disgusted 
I need to go and try to reach out to my friend. This is someone who is massively, massively messed up and injured and, you know, more than just his physical injuries. And it would be completely fitting with his arc that we see, uh, you know, continuing through the, like the animated series and stuff for have him have a last final appeal to try to try to bring Vader back and have Vader just not be able to, you know, Anakin can't forgive him. Can't, can't go cross that bridge at that point, you know? Yeah. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. That's, that's really, really good. I think that there's a couple places where the series can go that, um, and we'll probably talk about that in the next question uh, that I think will be, really intriguing in that regard so for me i mm-hmm. agree that leia and obi-wan is one of the best parts of this series their interaction with one another and also you know for people saying that they don't like where obi-wan is i, I have to say this maybe and i think most of them are probably a little younger maybe not but just 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 uh continue to age a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> let the world turn you <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly because i think what we see what, what, one of the things i've really found a lot of value in is i found a lot of value in you know it's reminiscent of characters like uh bruce willis's character in tears of the sun where he's this sure. aging soldier um or or old man logan i think some of these characters yeah. are better older and why are they better older because some of the things, what are the things that happens? I used to work at a university. Um, I've worked at university several times in my, in my life. And, you know, the younger generation has this enthusiasm, but they don't realize what they don't realize yet. And, you, you know, they, of course. they have this sure. idea that we're going we're gonna to stay really good looking and we're going to have all this energy. And it's like, okay, you know, we don't all, we don't all get that. We all, we, we, we're going to face hardships. We're going to have traumas in life. We're going to, we're going to experience things that make life a lot more difficult. And so I think that there's a truth to being an older human being and facing the consequences of not only our own actions, but just the world around us um, changing in ways that we never expected before. So I love, I love that aspect of it. Um, So what I didn't expect was I did not expect to include Leia. I would have told you I am one of the I'm on the opposite side of the fence that you are that like I could I could literally never see the Skywalker era again and I would be totally cool with it right sure. mm-hmm. um and part of it is because I do feel myself getting really excited to see the the same characters in a different light but at the same time part of me thinks yeah but if we stay in the if we stay in the derivative and if we don't kind of break sure. out into you know um, what the old Republic did for video games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like those things were those things were presented Star Wars in a fresh light, in a in a more serious light, but still had some you know comedy associated with it. And so that those kinds of things bring new life to these things. So I do prefer that. So when I saw that Leia was going to be in it, my first thought was, oh bummer, yeah. because this is going to convolute a lot of things. Right. Um, then my second thought was. Wow, the way that they're doing this is extremely good. So that kind of like alleviated my fears about it. The only thing that I'm thinking now, and we still have two episodes left, and I think a lot can happen in two episodes. You mentioned, and by the way, they've actually, you know, uh, Ewan McGregor has sort of indicated that he would like to do more episodes. Right. Yeah. Very, <laughs> so, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very interested in doing more episodes. So I think that there is a lot of room to continue sure. to mm-hmm. explore this aspect of it. But I will say that the longer the show has gone on and the closer that Leia and Obi-Wan have have become, despite the fact that I love it as a part of this show, it does bring up a lot of things where I go, oh man, that that doesn't feel right. And we're going to get into it. We're gonna, my next question is about canon. So okay. we're going to explore this in a lot of detail, but it just starts to feel like that's not quite the way that those things seem like they would sure. piece together so how are they going to get us there and i, and I think that there's, oppor- there's opportunity you you talked about it already like having obi-wan actually try to turn vader in the next two episodes or in the next season if we get another one makes a lot of sense for what you see in later on when he's talking to luke sure mm-hmm. and you know i i think that at this point i feel like we're definitely going to get a i think we're going to get sort of some sort of mind wipe for leia And she's not going to remember Obi-Wan the same way that she used to remember Obi-Wan. I say that because the one moment that I experienced was, and the reason why I included this as the thumbnail of the video that we're doing now, is that I thought to myself, 
man, Luke, who just met sure. Obi Wan Kenobi, was so much more upset at his death. But at this kind of connection, how could Leia not be completely devastated? You know, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Um, and I think, I think, obviously, one thing that we are working with with the, these films, uh, specifically, you know, the originals, um, is that they were constructed without a lot of things in mind. You know, um, we it's, <laughs> right. it's very clear, um, you know, that they didn't plan for Vader to be Luke's father until later, that <laughs> totally. they didn't plan for Luke and Leia to be sisters. So like, you can find yeah. this stuff uh, and piece it together from Lucas. And I mean, he will say like, oh, I planned it. But what he did is more like he had like 14,000 versions of this script. And in yes. some he had it planned and in some it wasn't quite that. And at the time, A New Hope, he didn't, that was not the intent. He didn't go, hey, let's have them kiss so that they can find out their brother and his sister later. <laughs> right. I mean, at that point, they were potentially romantic partners. Um, yeah. And uh, so that's that's going to cause, you know, some um, some conflict. Yeah. But what I what I find really interesting is, again, where uh, it almost for every piece that it takes, like it takes away, it gives something, you know, yeah. um, it's really interesting to watch the the Ben Kenobi, Darth Vader confrontation in A New Hope, because there are things that make you go, hmm, once once you're like in an era with all these Star Wars stories beyond the three classic movies, I mean, he he says to Obi-Wan, you should not have come back. And you're like, well, what the hell does that mean? Like, was he on the, <laughs> right. the Death Star at some point? When did, where did he, when did he come back from? Where is, <laughs> is this just a big, like, we well, shouldn't have come back into my life. Um, and and it, it's obviously was not intentional. But what I find really interesting is at that point, Alec Guinness only refers to Darth Vader as Darth. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that was obviously it was his first name when they were filming. Now it's a whole different thing. It's yeah. a character who once referred to this person as a brother. Yeah. Refusing to even address him as anything but like Sif, yes. you know, yes. evildoer. Yeah. Um, and so that has its own context as well, too. You know, it, it gets recontextualized in a really interesting way. And uh, the, the things that are selling me on the on the Leia, I mean, I do think that there are contradictions so 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 it's the one that you're you're talking about um the the reaction yeah. that obviously was a uh a, an aspect that they just didn't film you know uh right. they weren't aware of it right but if if i'm to make an argument for it i guess what i would say is obi-wan is very important to her she but she only i'm going to imagine only had this one experience you know mm -hmm. she so a couple days he did save her life, but a couple days in a princess's life when she was, what, eight, nine years old right. uh, versus the fact that everyone she knows and her entire planet has been eradicated, you know, what, an hour or two previously. <laughs> right. So right. I, I there's part of me that can go. Yes, it does seem weird that she is comforting Luke in in uh, the Millennium Falcon because right. you're like, well. This guy lost what is, quote unquote, a main character in the movie we're watching. But in the reality of what they're existing, this guy lost one old guy and she <laughs> lost her right. entire world, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so so I guess there's there's the way that I make it work is, again, just headcanon of like, this is who Leia is. You know, yeah, she yeah. she um, she's able to take these blows to a certain degree in, in a really, in a really strident way. And perhaps we see her. Um, you know, feel the pain, feel the weight of it uh, off screen. And 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 the only reason I reference that is I think what this series is doing and what they they have they try to do occasionally is serve characters that ha have been underserved. You know, yeah. the focus was on Luke through the main trilogy. And Leia is a real hero, you know, and, and we lost the opportunity. The third sequel was supposed to be a Leia focused story as well. And, right. and that was kind of stolen from uh, everyone by by yeah. uh, Carrie Fisher's untimely passing, stolen even from her, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is neat about this is that they get to add uh, some real layers to this character and show, you know, different um, aspects of her. But we also get to connect her to Obi-Wan and we see Obi-Wan understand the importance I guess the, in just talking about this, the one thing that I'm going I'm going to have to sit with for a while and go right now, what was happening here is yeah. why does he suggest because of this? Why does he suggest that only uh, Luke is their you know their hope that the, Yoda has to remind him? No, no, we got two Skywalkers. You know, right. there, there's 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 got to be a reason that he thinks 
only Luke can do it or speaks that way. Mm. Um, but but it'll it'll definitely be interesting. Um, the last thing I'll say, and, and and I would love to get your response on on all of this, Jay. Is the last thing that really is helping me uh, connect the dots here. Yeah, is the fact that she named her son Ben. Oh, you know, yeah. it means so much more now. I mean, before it was clearly, oh, you know, obviously of someone who means a lot to us. Now yeah. that name carries a significant weight for Leia that I don't know that I felt it did before. And yeah. and it really uh, it makes it makes what happens with her son even more tragic to some yeah. degree. You yeah, know? absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, part of it for me is that there is um, there's this I there's this idea that like fans should care about Canon and, and, sure. mm -hmm. and that these, all of the new shows will sort of suggest something that might be different from either what has been explicitly stated in Canon or like you said, what has become head Canon where in our head, that's the way that it works. Right. And, right. Right. Um, and I think that for me, uh, the concept of Canon is actually a fairly, um, recent it's a fairly recent concept applied to fiction i mean if we're going back to like you know deciding what's in the biblical canon like <laughs> that's different right that was that's something that's like in the sure. in the religious sphere and people will make their decisions about what that looks like for whatever major religion is a part of uh, they're a part of this is a part of it as a part of it being in in fandom is fairly recent we haven't had a lot there hasn't had been these series the series that have been uh movie upon movie upon movie or book upon book upon book they they have generally speaking been more episodic in nature and not serial in nature yeah and so now we're finding ourselves in a place where we have franchises built around these ideas and so then canon has so i i think that part of the reason people care so much about canon I mean, I think that they're, they're probably, although I, I uh, this is just a, a real, um, this would just be a real uh, unexplored estimate of mine. I okay. think that that even using the word canon and having it tied to religious materials almost <laughs> gives it like, it almost gives it like this like sacredness, right? Sure, like, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. If you break canon, how terrible is that? Oh, right? man. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and I also think that... Disney did not do themselves any favors sure. by saying, by the way, all the things that you, the, especially older fans, all the things that you older fans loved in the extended universe right. materials, that's not canon anymore. And so, so it was kind of like, they, they're almost telling you canon is of the utmost importance because we're saying that we can't continue with this being canon. So sure. the other one's more important. And so then when they, when they do things that may, rock the boat so to speak of what may be happening i think it it's almost like they dug their own grave in that regard right it's like you should really pay attention to canon like oh okay well you're now you're screwing up my canon you know um and i just i do think that that's a, an undercurrent of where we're sure. at right now um i will say this um from a storytelling perspective one of the things that um, I firmly believe in, in terms of, as I've explored stories on my own, is that the human brain being wired for story, and there's plenty of research to show that, you know, yeah. if you read Lisa Cron's book, Wired for Story, she talks about how human beings are wired for story. It's the main way that we communicate with one another. Um, being that that is true, one of the biggest questions that stories ask us to consider is why. So why does this happen in the world? Well, this can happen and that can happen and this thing can happen before. And so it's it's basically building building in our brains an understanding and an interpretation of the world built on asking the question, why? Why do people go to the dark side? Well, it's because of hate and it's because of anger. And it's because of fear. And you can track it back to why, 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 why? Oh, OK. Sure. But then I can see those things occurring in my own life. Um so I think all of that's true. And, and what that then does is that if the storytellers interpret the why differently than it has been interpreted the, in the past, and then they don't come up with an explanation for why it was interpreted differently in the past, I think it can break our brain's natural process of going like, but I, I thought we already answered that or the way sure. that you're answering it now seems to contradict the way that you're answering it in the future. Now, Having said all of that, it does sometimes take me out of it a little bit. Sure. However, 
the interesting part of that is it usually only takes me out of it when I've been told that it's really important. So, for example, I'm wearing my Stranger Things shirt today, by the way, because okay. if you're just listening, if you're just listening, you don't know, but I'm wearing a Stranger Things shirt. One of my favorite shows. Um, I love Stranger Things. And one of the things the writers did as season four started, the Duffer Brothers, they came out and said, just, just so you know, we realized that season four, because we're doing some flashback things and you're seeing some things, just want to let you know, some of this will probably break a little bit of the canon. And all they had to do was say that, and I have not heard a single person complain about it. And yet on the Star Wars side, their writers are saying things like, canon is of the utmost importance. We would never break canon. And so you're seeing these people get, what are you talking about? Like, you can't. So I think that there's, I think continuity does suffer, but it suffers more when we're told that canon is almost like the the most important thing that could be sure. talked about. Yeah. And um, and I think Star Wars has maybe gotten a little bit too deep into that to the point where it's harder to <laughs> it's harder to appreciate. Now, I do I want to say this though. I do appreciate that there are multiple story groups within Lucasfilm and they're all thinking about canon and they're all trying to work it out about what so right. so my 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 any discomfort I have, I also say there's more to be told here. Right, yeah. like there's more to come. It, all you have to do is uh, give Leia a mind wipe, and to me, that solves everything. Like it, it, it just does, right? Like it's not a big deal. And by the way, this was the first episode where I had a problem with it because people were bringing it up earlier as in in terms of like little tiny turns of a phrase that they're like, "Well, this is what it said." The the exact one slips my mind right now, but it was the it was the uh, it was one of the things that um, there was an exchange between. Leia and Invader, I believe, or maybe it was a uh, maybe it was Obi Wan and Invader. But anyways, point being, it didn't that that stuff didn't bother me. I'm like, that's a little tiny bit of a turn of phrase. So yeah. it wasn't until this one where I'm like, their bond is becoming so deep that it feels weird for me to then fast forward to a new hope. But I think that I still think that they're going to solve it. But I I can I can acknowledge that okay for those who have been trying to suspend their disbelief, this could be pushing them to their limits. I, I would, I would, you know, I completely understand that. Um, I'm not, I'm not necessarily one who likes to take a strong opinion on invalidating others. <laughs> right, in right, 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 right. Star Wars because I, yeah. I think that there is so, there are so many interpretations to be made. And, yeah. and honestly, um, I, while I can understand, like, while people get focused on these, these turns of phrases, I feel like um, in some ways that, uh, is disingenuous to the idea of how humans speak yeah, um, because true. we don't always tell the truth in every moment and not everything is like, I'm going to say exactly what happened last time. And this, this is the hundred percent honest truth. And I'm not putting any subtext in. You know? <laughs> uh, it, 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 so, so I'm, I'm more forgiving um, yeah. from a certain perspective about that. Um, and, and I guess in one sense, like I, one way I, I can re relate that to this conversation is, uh, for me, I haven't reached the point where I need a mind wipe. I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to that, but okay. I can, I, you know, I can see that um, being something that could potentially happen. The more interesting, um, I guess, canon solution that I have heard mm. is that one of, that that Obi Wan's parting gift would be sharing memories of uh. or visions of Padme with his daughter, yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah. or his daughter with Leia, yeah. not his daughter. Um, um, you know, solving, solving that the issue that's been there since the prequels of like, well, how do you remember your mother, you know, given that you were only with her, um, you know, for a, a, mo a few moments, um, yeah. and, and they, I mean, there's always been like that question of what could happen there. I also saw another article that, that was uh, saying that Obi-Wan's memories of his family, Mm. Um, imply that maybe if you have a strong force uh, sensitivity, you retain some of these memories. So maybe that's sure. how she, you know, the same way that he remembers, you know, his his brother kind of, or, you know, right. like even though he was a very, very young baby when he was taken. Um, but w speaking specifically about uh, you, your ideas about canon, I think, I think you are on to something. I think what has happened um, if I look back at what the decision was made, I do think that they they were in difficult situation Disney when they they took you know uh, the Star Wars franchise. They they 
I think it was a smart choice to essentially go, hey, this is what is going to be canon as we build, because they to try to wield everything that was involved. I mean, you had several layers of canon at the point. You had like the original trilogy, EU. Yeah. Things got recontextualized for the prequels, like Boba Fett's mm -hmm. story completely changed and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so it was kind of a mess, even though it was a lot of fun and a lot of great aspects. So the idea of going, we're going to make this Legends and we're going to reintegrate this stuff as we tell more stories in certain ways and reimagine it, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a bad idea. And you just had to kind of accept like some people were not going to come along for the ride. <laughs> right, right. It's going to be too much for them. But I do think that the way that they've handled it, um, while I'm very complimentary uh, about, you know, the the content that they've put out because I've enjoyed a lot of it, the way they've approached the canon and sort of the planning of this has not been the strongest, you know, right. effort. Obviously, right. we can see that in the schism with the sequel trilogy where I, you know, I'm not going to say that any of those films are unenjoyable or... Um, right. I, I, that I think they're horrible, but they don't sink in a way that makes you feel like there's a, a master vision. It does feel sort of invented as we go. Correct. Um, and, and they got, you got what you got, um, <laughs> right. you know, and it does feel like the problem with some of this is that they're trying so hard to be the MCU, which I don't know if is a bad thing, right. but it's it, sometimes uh, people, studios specifically, less than people, chase the MCU without really understanding it, you yeah. know? Um, the MCU has has benefited a lot of ways the original Star Wars has, where they planned out just enough and adapted enough that it worked in yeah. some magic way. It might not do that forever, but it did for a really good period of time. Yeah. Um, and they really pushed the idea of, like, it's all connected. Yeah. Um, so you set up a, a, a goal or a standard for yourself, and if you don't meet that standard... Um, that is going to be difficult. I think that's slightly different than like recontextualizing stuff, but you still get into a messy place where you're like, or you better be good at recontextualizing it because yep. otherwise don't touch it. You know, <laughs> exactly, like, yeah. like do it, do something that is um, worthwhile or well done. Um, and I, I think that it's been hit or miss with, with some of this stuff. I think things like, um, you know, the, like Clone Wars is one thing that I go back to that just like, and that was mostly before the Disney era, but it, it really pushed back against canon and like the idea of like, well, I remember it being like, why does Anakin have like a Padawan? What the hell is all this? You know, right. and now this is one of, you know, Ahsoka is one of the most popular characters and that character has brought in so many fantastic moments and stories to Absolutely. the universe that it's like, okay, well maybe there is room to make these really big jumps sometimes just because it wasn't mentioned in this movie doesn't mean that it's impossible right. that these things didn't happen. And one thing I guess I, I will say that there's two ways that I think that both like it's actually I guess it's one way, but I think both the studio and fans should approach it. Mm. And uh, for Disney, for Lucasfilm, what I would say is lean into the fact that these are fairy tales and myths. You yeah. know, these do not have to be like the most um, scientifically connected, detailed stories. Like you could go with the idea of like, hey, each one of these is a legend to a degree, you know? Right, so there's right. some flexibility, there's some fuzziness, but the idea is that we're telling a story about these morals and these values and these characters. Yep. Um, and, and, and I think fans need to do the same thing. You will get more out of these stories if you can kind of go, you know what, when we find a new one, it's just adding to the myth. It's not going to, if you don't want it to change a new hope, then just go like, well, you know what, for me, my Star Wars are these three trilogy, you know, these three yeah. movies. I know people who don't even like Return of the Jedi, so they only <laughs> have three movies, you know? <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, you, you can make a, a, of it what you want, and I don't, I don't necessarily understand the idea of, like, if other people enjoy it or if there's more that, that, that makes it... Uh, cheaper for you i do i do understand this idea of like let's let the stories spread let's if we're going to have skywalker saga stories well let's also have other stories as right. well and i do think lucasfilm is going to start pushing into that arena soon um but but yeah i think canon um is interesting it's something writers should should keep in in uh in mind i don't think you should go in and just purposely break the canon because that's <laughs> right. unfortunate and aggressive but um but I also don't think that you should 
canon should not get in the way of a fantastic story. If the story is that good, the, you find a way working with the story group, working with a writer yeah. to, to make that work to enough of a gr degree that you can tell the story because it's worth telling, you know? Yeah. Oh, I think all of that makes a ton of sense. And I think you're right on. I think there is, um, do you, even to, even to your point about like George Lucas broke his own canon. <laughs> yeah. Like when you go from the original trilogy to the prequel trilogy, he broke things. When you go from movie one to movie two, like you brought up earlier, he breaks things. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is again, that those are the growing pains of learning about what has become sequels and prequels and franchises that we never would have thought before were even going to be a thing. If you think about James Bond, like that, that again was episodic. There wasn't any, they were, these weren't built upon one another. They were, here's James Bond in another adventure, you know, sure. maybe um, some slight connections, but nothing like what we're seeing these days. We're in a, we're in a whole new era of entertainment and, and yes, that is, it's probably frustrating for people who are like, I remember having that classic, simple moment with a one space fantasy movie you know in 77 in in a movie theater with this audience that was alive but at the same time you as an older person um and i include myself in that, <laughs> in that <category. laughs> yeah. as an older person i think you need to go the experience has changed as does generations as this time and now the experience is something where as a young person you get to come into this universe and the same way that we like would have sifted through the comics or the the novels they have all these tv shows and yeah. cartoons and, and movies and they're we will not we will die before seeing the last star wars movie you <laughs> yeah, know like true, that that's true. what will be really interesting to see what generations are going to come out of that what kind of storytellers come out of experiencing things like the MCU and, and Star Wars on a, such a grand scale. Yeah. Well, and, and to add on to that, and we, I got one more question for you, but to add on to that, um, the fact that each generation of the last four generations has grown up with a different starting point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's another big thing. Like, I mean, you will find people who grew up with the prequels as being their first Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. You have a very different impression of what canon should actually look like. So, because for example, um, I did a video about Boba Fett in the Boba Fett series mm -hmm. and how basically Lucas created two Boba Fetts. He created the Boba Fett from the original trilogy, who had who was a loner, who didn't have anything such, as, who didn't seem to have any sort of tribal affiliations or uh, parental affiliations, or he was just a lone. Very quiet bounty hunter. It's, it was Clint Eastwood. He was, he was yeah. the man with no name. You know, exactly. that's straight up what he was. Yeah, exactly. And then what? Then what he did was, and George Lucas did this in the prequel trilogy. He said, "No, he's a derivative. He's not original because he's another. I mean, yeah, he's a he's a non altered clone, but he's still part of a giant group of individuals who exist who have been created. And he had a father that he had a familial relationship with." Uh, much more than any other clone that was that was out there. Yeah, and and not only that, but his, even his armor isn't unique because his armor is very similar <laughs> to, and derivative from his father's armor. Yeah. So he created he created a person who, if you take original trilogy Boba Fett, which is what my favorite character at one point in time. Yeah, yeah. And you and you fast forward to the Boba Fett series, you would go, "Who in the world is this guy?" But if you actually take Boba Fett from the prequel trilogy, it fits very nicely because you because it's a guy who's trying to rebuild a tribe and he gets involved in a tribe and it would make sense that he would be, but the other Boba Fett, you'd be like joining a tribe. Like that doesn't make any sense. Like, and I yeah. think what, what Disney artfully did, although many people will probably disagree with me on this, but I think what Disney artfully did is they said, Hey, everybody who liked the original trilogy, Boba Fett, you get the Mandalorian and everybody who liked prequel trilogy, Boba Fett, you get Boba Fett in the Boba Fett series. Um, and so I think that, uh, it, your starting point defines what you think should happen or shouldn't happen. Um, and we have a, we have a whole other starting point, which is just sequel trilogy people who just started watching during that era. Yeah. So yeah. we have, we, have, it's very complex and it's, I mean, to top it off, there's business reasons for doing things too. <laughs> right. So it, it just becomes a very convoluted thing. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, like, I think what your message is to people is really good. Is like, your brain has has learned to wrap itself around and embrace 
a version of what canon is. Nobody can take that away from you. Even if even if Disney takes it away from you by saying something else is true, you don't have to pay attention to that. Just love what you love. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's already try I mean, I, I love the guy, but he already tried to take it from you. I mean, he he made the special editions and then went, you can't have the originals. You can't have them. You know, like, I know it's true. I mean, so so I mean we should be used to this. We should uh, as yeah. Star Wars fans, you know, it's a it's an old trauma. We need to learn from Obi-Wan. <laughs> And, and move through, move forward, you know? <laughs> I like it. I like it. I love it. So last question I have for you, and then we'll close out the show. So this this, this uh, fortress Inquisitoris yes. uh, holds secrets below the surface, yes. right? Yes. Um, and one of those secrets is revealed in this episode to be the Jedi graveyard, the Jedi tomb. So what did you think of that reveal? Um, and is there something more going on there? What, what's your whole take on that? My take is that this is the connective tissue through the the majority of the TV series. I would say that this is probably not present, if I remember correctly, in um, in Book of Boba Fett. But then by the presence of Grogu, it might be. Because um, mm -hmm. I think what essentially we're seeing here is what Filoni does best. Um, and that's, I'm just, I'm picking that. I don't know that he's completely responsible. Deborah Chow is, is, is you know, taking on this series. I don't want to take any credit. Right. from her regarding uh, her vision and and the work that she's doing on this series but uh if you look at the fact that the tv series spawned off of mandalorian and feloni and favreau um you know com uh collaborating on that you you can kind of see feloni's hands on each one of the series a little mm -hmm. bit you know mm -hmm. um and uh in this sense uh i don't mean that he's written obi-wan kenobi or that he depict or he uh detailed the story or anything but one of the connective tissues that we see uh, Filoni sort of filling in here, mm -hmm. like he did with Clone Wars for the prequels, is he's going through the sequels with this idea of bringing Palpatine back and having him clone himself and going like, well, how did that work? And I guess one thing that I, I know other people are frustrated by this, but one thing I like is that there is a connective tissue now through all of the Skywalker saga mm -hmm. uh, that uh, talks about not only i guess there it shows um the long game that palpatine was playing you obviously see the what the manipulations he did politically but there was also an obsession with planet destruction as as a um a form of intimidation yep. uh, he returns to it again and again he's trying to build it from the prequels he finally builds it it gets destroyed he wants to build more eventually he wants to have one on every ship you know <laughs> um and and as ridiculous as that might seem as derivative um, I look at our own uh, obsession with like weapons of mass destruction and I'm like, is this really that far from like the way we approach things? You know, like, have we gotten over nukes at this point? No. Right. If we could do it, if we could do it smaller and better, would we? Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, and this is, this connects, I think the tomb connects to the cloning aspect, as I was saying, I think we've mm. seen that in Mandalorian with Grogu and some of the, uh, like black sites for the empire there yeah. we've seen that there is an obsession with collecting force sensitive individuals both for uses inquisitors but also it seems that palpatine is searching for a way to clone force sensitive people and the only way that or the only reason i can think that that would really serve him is to be able to jump bodies for himself he wants mm. to be able to clone himself uh and be able to have his power beyond death you know yeah. he wants to be able to extend his life beyond death which is the ultimate sith goal is to subvert the natural order of things uh yeah. and if you can live beyond natural death that would be the ultimate achievement we see that i mean obviously the story of darth plagueis so here we're seeing i think clearly um there's part of it that is like, hey, look at all these Jedi that we have desecrated. Um, part of it is just to be able to, to, you know, put your thumb in the Jedi's eye again. But another part I have to think is genetic material. They're mm. holding on to each of these, these force sensitive individuals, their body, because one of them might hold the key for what Palpatine's main goal is to, to find a way to survive past death. Yeah. What are your thoughts? You, do you agree with that? I do, and I want to ask you a question. Have you seen all of Rebels? I have, yes. Okay, so Brian Barbary asked, "Were the tombs ever in Rebels? Do you remember?" Because I haven't, I haven't seen all of Rebels. I've only seen parts of it. I do not believe. I mean, I I've seen it twice through. I do uh, not believe that I remember the tombs being present. But there was, 
still that focus of uh, Palpatine looking for force sensitive individuals, um, trying to ma ma manipulate Ezra. And, and I would say that the world between worlds, um, which sort of for, for people that don't know is, is sort of the Star Wars equivalent of like time travel and uh, in, in, a, in a fantasy mystical way, um, mm -hmm. seems to fit though with that goal. I mean, if, yeah. if that's another way for him to subvert natural death, if he finds a way to unlock the keys to subverting the timeline, yeah. well, then he doesn't need the clones, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that's the the ultimate goal for Palpatine is just to to maintain his power beyond death. He knows that he killed his, his uh, master, that yeah. it is the natural way of the Sith to attempt to betray and kill one another because the idea is that is that is your religion because that makes you both stronger you know yep. if you if you if you can be killed by your apprentice you deserve to die and they deserve to be the master so so i think um he is just following he's being a good sith he's being the best sith he can be you know right, right, right. For, the, for the way to uh to bend the the living force to his will yeah. So a couple couple things I, I, I want to remark on that you mentioned. I think I think you're I think you're onto something really um, that's accurate. But let me go back a second and sure. say, to respond to something you said earlier in the show that I think is really true as well. I think the moment where Obi Wan walks into the tomb, for lack of a better word, which I, I agree with you, it's not just a tomb, is very impactful to him for a very different reason, and that is. Right now, he has a tie to both Luke and Leia. Luke, starting with Luke, and then with Leia after. And his mission was, I'm overwhelmed with fear. I don't know what's going to happen, but I must believe that Luke is the chosen one. And therefore, partially because of fear and partially because um, I want to believe it and, and want to cling to what the hope of the future could look like, um, I need to be the monitor of Luke Skywalker because sure. he will do something that maybe I can no longer do. Right. I think this scene, though, gives Obi-Wan a greater picture of how devastating not only Vader and Palpatine were 10 years ago, but how devastating they continue to be. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're. It, this is not just about ruling the galaxy. This is about something far bigger. And 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 I think that there's something this to say, to to that will prompt Obi Wan to think, I have a bigger role to play in this. Even if it is just related to Luke and Leia in some way, I have a bigger role to play that is is beyond this my sense of what myself is because what my sense of self was closed me off to all the other pain of the world. And now the Force is basically suggesting to him that he needs to open himself back up to you cannot stay a, a hermit or if you are going to stay a hermit be prepared for the time where i call you to train the next generation because it's coming um which i think was really cool and until until you kind of reference that a little bit in the beginning of the show i'm like oh yeah that's awesome because i hadn't thought of it that way but that's opening him up to more to more thinking you make, a, make a great point because it makes me think of that scene in the first episode where he sees the the boss uh for the carcass that he's working on i guess oh, yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> um, just kind of um completely steal and and demoralize and and depress you know one of his fellow co-workers and and he just takes it you, you, you know the guy literally is like what do you got something to say and he doesn't you know yeah. And uh, it's such a it's just, it, it is painful to see. I understand why people might have been shocked or like, I don't want to see Obi-Wan like this. Well, I get that. But that is a place where he is at. And and it makes me think of a thing that you had said earlier that um, I had forgot that I wanted to mention this. But but you were talking about, you know, how um, the younger generation sometimes struggles with with seeing a character like a powerful character or a close beloved character broken like this. Um and I, you know, I don't even know that it's completely uh, age focused. It might be in it generally, but um, I think people that have not suffered uh, yeah. the same way struggle with this. But I think that this character has to speak to a lot of people and, and uh, not to get too political, but what is really important about these stories right now, I think, is that a lot of Star Wars, where we're talking like Bad Batch or Obi-Wan mm -hmm. or um, the sequel trilogy, um, they're talking about what you do when fascism is rising yes. and how how 
how hard it is to live under fascism and oppression. Um, and that's the key here is like there, it is not fun to be Obi-Wan, not just because of what he's lost, not just because of what his mission is, but because he has to feel the suffering around him all the time. He lives and he's not the only one. Everyone lives in this world. And so I think there are some, some, what you're hitting on here is I think there's some subtle, um, parallels here and probably intentionally of like, this is supposed to be a final solution to a degree, yeah, you know, right. this is uh, Obi-Wan being part of a certain class of people that are being hunted down and eradicated in, in a systematic way, you know, like a machine that they're yeah. being fed into. And I think I hadn't really thought about that, that, that way. I thought of it more from a personal connection, but you bring up a great point. And I, whether it's him imagining Leia and Luke as children in those in those tombs. Yes. Or just the idea of I sat on my hands for 10 years and look exactly. what they did. Just like when I told that one Jedi that came to me, the fight is over, go away, bury this. And then the next day he's hanging in the town square. Yep. I think there's a, a, a you're exactly right. There's a clear message here, either from the force or just from his experiences that there's a different way to do this. You can yes. still, yeah, you can still have that mission that you have. You can still protect Luke, but, but you need to still be a force for good in this universe because there's not the, 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 the I guess the price of sitting out is yes. too harsh. You know, the, you will not be able to save these people. People are dying, you know, like yep. they, they, you can't go back in time and, and, and change this. This is yes. the price. Yes, absolutely. I, to I totally agree. And I think, so to, to go back to the, um, to are these tombs? I don't think they're tombs. And here's why. Okay. I think you nailed it. The, the Sith are from Plagueis to Palpatine to Vader. Let's not forget, Vader is still likely trying to bring Padme back. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so there's this idea that if we can collect enough power, if we can suck the power out of somebody else so that I can take it on, then maybe it would give me the chance for immortality or whatever. And so um, just a final thought, it because re it reminded me very much of, um, th they all look like they're in amber. And that reminded yeah. me so much of uh, Jurassic Park <laughs> and how they were able to bring back dinosaurs from that. And so I, I, I have a, I, whether it is, whether it's clones, whether it's, um, whether it's just trying to extract power from them, whatever it ends up being, I totally agree with you that there's something more there. Um and and we've almost done an hour and a half, so I'm gonna let you get back to your family. But before you do, why don't you go ahead and plug um, plug your channels again? Tell people where to find you, and uh, and maybe even give us your favorite comic book that you published recently that you okay. encourage people to read. Well, uh, first off, Jay, thank you so much for this. This was a fantastic opportunity. I love talking Star Wars uh, with people that love it, and I love talking with you because you love storytelling so much. So so thank you for inviting me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. It's been great to have you. Um, if you want to find me or, or Fanbase Press, you can find us at fanbasepress.com. Uh, Fanbase Press ha is, is on all social media, so search for us. Um, we do uh, comic book publishing. Um, we have a geek culture uh, wet, uh, uh, wing to the site that uh, focuses on, on stories and discussions just like this one. Um, so definitely, yeah, come on over, check out our, our content, find us online. Uh, if you want to find me specifically online, you can find me uh, at Comic Book Slayer on Twitter, uh, uh, at Comic Book Sniffer on Instagram. Um, you'll get a lot of Star Wars hot takes uh, <laughs> along with like Aliens, Buffy, uh, all my obsessions, and of course, <laughs> Fanbase Press. And um, Fanbase Press, what would I recommend? Uh, most recently, we have um, actually, I guess it ties into what we were just discuss discussing. Most recently, we've released a title called Nuclear Power uh, uh -huh. that is a uh, alt history uh, sci-fi story. We describe it as The Handmaid's Tale meets uh, the X-Men. Um, and so it's really um, focusing on what if the bombs actually dropped during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States was forced to uh, essentially give up certain ground, rebuild, and became more uh, fascist because of that. And uh, it experiences uh, one individual within that new uh, civilization coming to a realization that perhaps uh, the individuals in charge, the government she trusts is not the most trustworthy, not not uh, the most uh, 
goodwilled in mind and that perhaps the the rebel uh entities that are outside the border wall um are not the monsters that they've been described as as well so definitely check it out if you if you like uh stories uh like why the last man or the walking dead it should be right up your alley i would think that's awesome and not having read it i will say that um having seen plenty of your promotion of it the artwork is Thank phenomenal you. too and um and, and yeah so definitely go check that out it sounds like almost man in the high castle meets the cold war <laughs> if, you were to, yeah. if you were to take it that direction that's really really cool um so thank you again for being a part of the show before i close it out i will plug my own story just very quickly it, i'd love for you to read or listen to it if you're a fan of steampunk fantasy western mashups we call them weird westerns like a lot of other people do and pick up a copy of our full cast audiobook that's 11 voice performers acting out 14 different roles death of a bounty hunter is what it's called it's about a desperate sheriff who will do anything to save his daughter and a bounty hunter who realizes he can no longer run from the truth a link to death of a bounty hunter.com will be in the description down below so please, please support the show by picking up a copy please go support bryant and his whole crew by the way say hi to barbara for me we'll, um, we'll have to get her on the show pretty soon oh yes yes but that is it for today's show. If you have a topic or a question you'd like for me to cover, please leave me a comment or shoot me an email at hi at reclamationsociety.org. I'd love to include your questions or topics, topic ideas in a future show. New episodes of the Story Geek Show drop every week on both YouTube and on, our, on your preferred podcast provider. And I'm recording stuff throughout the week. So Wednesday is usually my primary release date, but there's too many things to talk about these days. So I'm <laughs> creating content all the time. But thank you for watching. Next week, I'll have more coverage of Obi-Wan Kenobi Episode 5. Plus, I'm working on Stranger Things Season 4 content as well. So stay tuned for all of that. And I will see you on the next show. And please go check out Bryant on his show as well. Bye, everybody. <laughs>